to encourage you and invite you to turn with me to, to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'm sure I must have mentioned this in passing before. The book of Acts is, in fact, my, my absolute favorite book in the Bible. It's hard to have favorites. You know, it's like your children. You pretend not to, but you always have a favorite. Just me. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm to, I'm to, those that don't know me are like, this guy's really cruel. I'm totally messing around. But, but as far as books of the Bible, I think we're probably okay in having a favorite. And I know many of you do kind of have the book that's the go-to for you, where you want to go back to and kind of sink your teeth in again at times of trouble, distress, confusion. For me, the book of Acts has, has been my favorite. I, I love this book. In fact, I will just, I'll open up and be honest with you. My, uh, Saturday nights as I'm preparing to preach the Word of God on a Sunday here at Oak Grove and, and by God's grace on this Lord's Day, I'll often get alone Saturday night and just open a Bible and just read the book of Acts. Just start at chapter 1, verse 1, and just read it to be reminded again that it's not about me and it's not about you, but it's about the empowerment of the Spirit in the church of Jesus Christ. I get so much out of that because the pressure and the, and the burden that, that pastors and preachers often feel, like we've got to stand up here and entertain you and we've got to be sufficiently humorous and we've got to be clear and we've got to, above all, we've got to be accurate with how we exegete the, the holy text of Scripture. As I turn to the book of Acts, I'm reminded that the church, this church, and every church founded upon the rock-solid granite bedrock of the gospel is Christ's church. It's not my church. It's not my burden. It's not, my, it's not that, that weight upon me to have to, to have to communicate gospel grace to you. If I'm honest and forthright and faithful, the Spirit will do the work through the Word. And so I, I love the book of Acts. I, I want to spend a bit of time in this book with you this morning. In fact, we're not going to, we're not going to exegete the whole book. That would be a sermon series maybe a year or two in the making. But I want to start at verse 8 of chapter 1. This is, a, this is the seminal text, the thematic text for the entire book. And then we're going to explore a little bit the, the book of Acts. So let's just start out in reading this incredibly inspiring verse. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. These are the words of Christ. He says, uh, pre-ascension, before he goes up to heaven, he says to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And to the ends of the earth. I want to speak a little bit this morning to that theme, that theme which becomes the theme for the entire story of the book of Acts, the story of the Christian church. When we turn to the book of Acts in our New Testament, we're reading our story. This is, if you like, this is our origins story, the book of Acts. This is the forming, the founding, and the, the beginning of the Christian church. And the promise of Christ, before this whole thing even gets up and running, the promise of Christ is, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and that power is for witness. The power is for witness. God gives it for a purpose so that we can stand and bear witness to the, the resurrected Jesus Christ gaining the victory over death and giving salvation to all who will receive Him, that we might be witnesses of Christ, endued with power from on high to stand and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. In Jerusalem, in the wider sur circumference region of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. The mission of the New Testament church is God's plan and God's pattern for every New Testament church. Even this today, this New Testament church. This is the pattern. This is the mission. This is the way that God has called us to be on mission for Christ, to do nothing less than bear witness to the resurrected Christ and His Lordship to all the world. Now this is, of course, this church here this morning, we are, we believe, a New Testament church. And by that, what we mean is not 
It's not so much that, that you can find in the New Testament, if you look close enough, you can find Oak Grove Baptist Church somewhere inscribed in the text. That's not what we mean. What we mean is that we have continuity with the church that we find in the New Testament. Continuity. That the church that Jesus founded on planet Earth as He ascended to glory, sent His Spirit down, that church, that church, the gates of hell, never prevailed against. That church, in the book of Acts, the gates of hell never prevailed against. That's the promise of Christ. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not gain the ascendancy. It shall not prevail. It shall not utterly extinguish the witness of the Christian church on planet earth to proclaim the goodness of God in Christ. Now that promise of Christ is no doubt unquestionably true, dependable, and reliable. That church in the book of Acts that we discover and read about has not been conquered and in fact exists right here today in our midst. We have continuity with that church in the book of Acts because we are a New Testament church going back to the text of Scripture to learn what God's will for us would be in Jesus Christ. That is such an essential point. I recognize that, that here at Oak Grove, uh, our church has a history of, of about 40 years. We've been around a little bit, not as long as other churches uh, around, but we're not claiming to be a church that was, that was literally planted 2,000 years ago. We're, we're claiming by identity and by the same Spirit that indwells us to be the same church that the same Spirit indwelt in the pages of the New Testament. And what that means is, I feel like it ought, to be, it ought to be a determination of every one of us, now every, every one of us, that we would see our church ever closer and closer and closer in line with the church that we meet in the book of Acts. Getting closer, getting closer, moving in the right direction. Are we following the example of Christ's apostles and their patterns? What I want to do with you this morning, and I don't normally do this because I, 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 feel like, I feel like as a presenter of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as a proclaimer and preacher, I don't want to get to that point where there seems to be some monotony in my, my proclamation. But if you could stay in the book of Acts, I want to do a little exercise with you this morning. This is rare, but I, I think this morning it's, it's needful. Let's go for a walk, if you will, through the book of Acts and just discover how God smiled upon how God poured out favor upon that initial church. So while you had the book of Acts, let's turn over to chapter 2. And this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to get you to just keep flipping the pages, read a verse or two, flipping the pages, read a verse or two, flipping the pages and read a verse or two. If you don't have a Bible and you want to keep up, you can, uh, you can grab a Bible from a pew pocket around you and, uh, and you can follow along with us as we discover how the Spirit empowers and favors the church of the New Testament. Acts 2, verse 41. So this is, friend, this is, this is how it starts. These, these disciples were told by Jesus, but remain in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll bear witness to me. So, so these small group of disciples, timid and, and shaking with fear, no doubt, went, to, went back into Jerusalem, the very, the very city that just killed Jesus. So they're, they're petrified, they're terrified, and they, they, they lock themselves in, in an upper room to just pray and just await this great moving of the Spirit. And the church is born on that day of Pentecost, when heaven sends forth the promise of the Father, the power of the Spirit, cloven tongues of fire settle upon each of them, they begin proclaiming the wonderful, mighty works of God in unknown tongues. And here's the, here's the aftermath. Verse 41 of Acts 2. So those who received His word were baptized. There were added that day, that day about 3,000 souls. Praising God, verse 47. Jump with me to verse 47 praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. If you're there uh, at that church in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2, this, what I've just read to you, is literally the norm. Day one, 3,000 souls saved. 
And then day by day, day by day, the Lord continues to add to their number those who are being saved. Cross over with me to chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We've got about a verse or two per chapter. So we're going to walk through the majority of this book and just take a look at how the Spirit empowers mission and the Spirit grants the fruit of gospel proclamation. Just verse 4 of, verse, of chapter 4, so Acts 4.4, 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. The number of the men. So in this church, they were at that point for whatever reason, because of, uh, because of the social and cultural milieu, they were just keeping a census of the men and the men alone numbered about 5,000. You want to add wives and, and maybe children. You've probably got a church in Jerusalem that's at this point ballooning somewhere around 20, 25, some say 30,000 people. The first church was a mega church. The, this is normal for this first church. Go over with me to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 14. Flip over. Let's take a look at this. Chapter 5, verse 14. So, so now, 5.14, we come to a verse, which, which is right at the back end of that ugly, terribly distasteful incident where the Lord strikes down dead Ananias and Sapphira right there in the meeting of the church. Struck dead. And verse 14 of chapter 5 says, And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So, so just for a moment, calibrate your thinking, right? Chapter 5, verse 14. Remember what we've just discovered. As we read chapter 2, then we look at chapter 4, we saw that, that, that thousands were added to the Lord through faithful gospel proclamation. But it's not till we get to chapter 5 that Luke, the author of this wonderful narrative, he says that in chapter 5, 14, once God struck dead the sinners Ananias and Sapphira, more than ever before. Just stop for a moment. Think about that wording. More, more than Pentecost, right? More than the healing of the paralytic at the gate beautiful, where, where it ended up being 5,000 men had joined the church with, of course, their, their wives and, and their children. And now, more than any of those previous episodes, multitudes, multitudes, multitudes of both men and women. If you would, go with me to chapter 6, verse 7. Chapter 6, verse 7. It says this, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So, so just, I know you got your eyes on the page, you may keep them there, but hear me for a moment. When we got to that verse in chapter 5, we sort of thought to ourselves, at some point, this has to peak, didn't we? Well, maybe you didn't, I certainly did. I thought to myself, Dave Pentecost, 3,000 souls. Healing of the paralytic at the gate, beautiful. You've got now 5,000 men with their wives and children. And then in chapter 5, you learn that more than ever multitudes are getting saved. We flipped over one more chapter and it tells us that this church, God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. There is, friend... At this point, in this, the first Christian church, there is no apparent end in sight to the missional, soul-saving glory of the Spirit-empowered church. If I was sitting where you were, I'd amen. Like, I would be so excited to read this. Thank you. Go with me to chapter 8. We've got some work to do, and I'm sure by the end of this, I'll get you sufficiently riled up. Acts chapter 8, verse 6. Did you, did you see what we saw? Now, I want you to go to chapter 8. I, I need you there. But just to revisit real quick, chapter 6, verse 7. We, we read that multitudes, multitudes, multitudes were hearing the word, receiving the gospel. A great many priests become obedient to the faith, and the disciples multiplied greatly in, do you remember what it said? What city did it identify? The gospel, the word of God multiplied, the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. If you could with me for a moment, take your mind back to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. What we encountered in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 was the thematic verse for the church 
in the book of Acts, the church of the New Testament. And of course, you can see my premise to this argument. That should be the thematic governing principle for every New Testament church, that the gospel would first plant its center in Jerusalem. And then it said, and all Judea. So, so if you would, just for, uh, just for our purposes and in, in our thinking about this, and so that we can perhaps modernize the concept, you've got, you've got the city of Jerusalem. Now, of course, the, the city of Jerusalem is precisely where the gospel of Jesus needs to start. And then Judea would, if you will, allow me, would be kind of like the, the surrounding county, if, if you want to think like that, the, the broader area. So when we come to chapter 8, we're now moving from Jerusalem All Judea heard the word. And now, chapter 8, verse 6, we're going to read verse 6 and then verse 14. We're going to read them together. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Verse 14, Samaria had received the word of God. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. If you would go with me to Acts 9, Acts chapter 9. All Samaria had received the word. It's an incredible revival. It's an incredible revival that the Samaritans have bought in, have bowed the knee, have confessed the Lordship of Christ and received this salvation. We've got Acts chapter 9. I hope at this point you're, you're not bored. I hope this is stirring and encouraging. Verse 31. We're going to read three verses in this chapter. Verse 31, verse 35, verse 42. uh, starting at verse 31. So the church throughout all, can you see it? Judea. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So it says, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. It multiplied. Verse 35, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, that's a a man that was healed, and they turned to the Lord. Two cities by themselves just turned to Jesus. Verse 42, it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So when you're reading your book of Acts, if you don't read the book of Acts following the narrative of the, the paradigm of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, you'll miss the grand meta-narrative of this book. Now we've come to a point where all Jerusalem has heard the word and many believe, multitudes of both men and women, even many of the priests in the temple have said, this Jesus, he's the Christ. He's the real deal. He's the Savior. I'm going to bow my knee, confess with my tongue, he is my Lord and my Redeemer. This is happening in Jerusalem. It balloons out to all Judea, even as far as Galilee, that, that churches are being multiplied. And then, and then Samaria is struck with the wildfire of revival and comes to faith. Now at this point, we're going to go over to chapter 11. Chapter 11. Now, of course, I'm, I'm reading, we're reading and focusing on the highlights interposed between these great moments of the word going forth, thousands and tens of thousands of souls being saved, churches planted, the gospel established, interposed throughout these great moments of highlights, of course, is prisons and deaths and persecutions and rejections and animosity, of course. The gospel provokes offense. The gospel innately by itself provokes offense. But my goal here this morning is to just follow these highlights as they crop up in the narrative to give us a sense of what we should expect if we are in continuity with the New Testament church. So so at this point, I'm not going to patronize you. you. You've heard me repeat this ad nauseum. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Now, now, so far in the narrative, we've seen Jerusalem, we've read about Judea, we've read about Samaria. What's been missing? The ends of the earth. You, it's okay, you can talk back, it's fine, you can answer. The ends of the earth as what's been lacking in this paradigm. So when we get to Acts chapter 11, we soon discover this. And it, it, it should be said at this point that this wonderful church in Jerusalem, 
that was planting churches, rapidly multiplying itself to pioneer new gospel works all over Galilee and, and Judea and, and Samaria, that, that they'd, they'd left off. They'd left off going to the ends of the earth. Now, I'm not going to accuse them of having done that intentionally. It's not necessarily their fault. But when we arrive at this chapter, the great episode of persecution, like a storm, has come down and hit the church in Jerusalem. And if we follow, at least as far as I've argued, and many commentators argue, that that church in Jerusalem is probably capacity at about 25 to 30,000 individual members, this storm of persecution after the stoning of Stephen comes down upon that church and scatters that church to the winds. So we read the result of this, the, the consequence of this in Acts 11. I'm going to read again three verses in this chapter, verse 20, 21, and 26. So go with me to Acts chapter 11. But there were some of them. Now when you read that, I, I want to interject briefly and say... That language, some of them, refers to original members of the church at Jerusalem that were scattered to the winds through the persecution of the stoning of Stephen. Some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, right, of course, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed, turned to the Lord. And when he had found them, verse 26, this is, speaking, this is speaking of Barnabas, when he had found him, Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And uh, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. It's not obvious to you at a, uh, at a plain reading of that text, just really what's happening here, because the reality is, for the most part, as we've read chapter 1 and chapter 2 and, and verses throughout basically every chapter leading up to, to chapter 11 of this wonderful account, the book of Acts, what was never explicitly said was that these disciples, these converts, these Jesus followers were primarily, if not exclusively, sharing their good news, the gospel, with people who were Jewish, people who were of Jewish descent, or at least Samaritans. And so when we arrive at chapter 11, you get a sense or get a sense of the, the pluck of these individuals. It says here in verse 11, there were some who came to Antioch and preached the Lord to Hellenists, to, to non-Jewish people. This is almost happening for the first time. The gospel has finally been communicated to, to those of us that would be Gentile. And of course, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great many believed and turned to the Lord. If you go with me to chapter 12, verse 24, one single sentence, chapter 12, verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Chapter 13, if you will, verse 44, sorry, verse 33, 44, and then 48, 49. Now, at this point, chapter 13, it's the church at Antioch. Remember, Antioch was started by a group of men full of pluck and courage and disinterest in the religiosity or the traditions that they'd inherited. They went to Antioch, one of the largest cities in the entire Roman Empire, and just started proclaiming Jesus to whoever will listen. Didn't matter. Didn't matter where you're from, what you did, what your ethnicity was, what your religious background was, you're getting the gospel. Very soon, that church at Antioch for where the term Christians was first used, at Antioch, that church becomes the epicenter of the entire New Testament world. It's that church at Antioch, not Jerusalem. This is so significant, but I do not have time this morning to discuss the significance of the reality of this. But it's Antioch that commences the first missionary endeavor to fulfill Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to the ends of the Earth. So when we come to Acts 13, that first missionary journey has begun. Paul and Barnabas. Verse 43 of Acts 13. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. 
for a moment, take stock. If you would with me this morning, take stock and say, what would that look like? Two missionaries turn up, no gimmicks, no fanfare, no bells and whistles, turn up with nothing other than a sure confidence in the Word of God, the entire city turns up. Try and get a, try and get a visual of that in your mind. Go down with me to verse 48, 48 and 49. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the Word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to eternal life, believed. And the Word of the Lord was spreading throughout the entire region. Acts 14, 1. It's okay, wait, we're almost at the end of this little exercise, but I'm sure it's doing all of us good. Acts 14, 1. Now at Iconium, they entered, uh, Paul and Barnabas, the missionaries, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue, spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Let's look at a couple more. Acts 17. Acts 17. I love that sound of pages turning. Do you love that sound? I do this every Sunday just to hear that sound. Just get you chopping and changes all over the Bible. If you've got an electronic Bible, you know, your fake Bible called the iPad, right? That's all right. That's what I use because I can blow the text up. Maybe you can get a swoosh feature added. Could you do that for us? Do that for just so we can get that, that sound. Acts 17, verse 4. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, different team now, and they did a great as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Then Paul goes down to Berea, and it says in verse 11 of Acts 17, Now the Jews in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Verse 12, Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as the men. Two more. I'll I'll take you to two more chapters. Go with me to chapter 19. I'm going to finish in chapter 21. Maybe you could just do the sound effect with your mouth. Just do it. Just, I don't know, it didn't do it for me. Acts 19, Acts 19, verse 10. This continued for two years. This is Paul teaching in Ephesus at the hall of Tyrannus. So that all the residents of Asia, just hear this, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. How many of them? Which continent? Yeah, that's a big deal. That's a lot of people. Verse 17, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, again, a mega city in the Roman Empire, both Jews and Greeks. Fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord, Jesus, was extolled. And verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. The gospel goes. Where the gospel goes, the gospel bears seed and bears a crop. Sometimes 30, sometimes 60, sometimes a hundredfold. Now, as I said, amidst all of this revival, yeah, imprisonments, imprisonment, persecution, martyrdom, whippings and beatings and, and torture and, and stonings, yes. Yes, the New Testament church is familiar with antagonism toward the proclamation of the gospel. But the New Testament church at no point, not for a moment, hesitates to stand its ground to proclaim the word. And the New Testament church expects the word to bear much fruit. That is the norm. I need to say it again. Some of us, this is going to, For some of us, this is going to crack a shell of a presumption that we have that churches, by their normality, need to struggle. That the Word of God in a normal New Testament Christian environment, the Word of God needs to struggle to bear a little bit of fruit. No, that's not the example we see. The example we see is the Spirit-empowered church on mission, on mission, bears much fruit. Now at this point, and maybe not you, maybe some of you are thinking, well, what happened to that original church in Jerusalem, right? What, what, what happened to it? I mean, it was doing great, and then persecution came, 
And it didn't ruin the church, but it certainly scattered the majority of the members to the the corners of the Roman Empire where they began telling people about Jesus and churches began to crop up everywhere all over the Roman world. What happened to that church? Go with me as our last text this morning. I've got a bunch more listed, but we'll finish up on this. Acts 21, verse 20. Acts 21, verse 20. After all of Paul's missionary labors, after all that Paul does, traveling the known world to proclaim Christ. He comes back to Jerusalem after many, many, many years. He sits down with the brother of our Lord, James. He has a book in the New Testament, the book of James. And he's the pastor of this church in Jerusalem. And Acts 21 records this unique conversation that the great missionary Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles, conversing, with the very brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus Christ, James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church. And James reports this. You see, brother, I'm reading verse 20, chapter 21, verse 20. You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. It was easy for us to follow the narrative of the book of Acts and, and, and see the gospel go from Jerusalem to the surrounding county, the region of Judea, over to Samaria, and then to the ends of the world through the, the missionary labor of the church at Antioch. And to think for a moment, the, the church of Jerusalem has kind of, it's kind of become a non-event. It's kind of become a church that's struggling and, 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 and shrinking and, and battling. And then James says to Paul, when Paul finally arrives back in Jerusalem, take a look, Paul. Thousands, thousands, thousands of Jews have received this good news of Jesus Christ. Brothers, sisters here this morning, that exercise is to do nothing less than compel you to see with an eye of faith that this is the norm. The norm. Nothing short of that, with its power, the Spirit's endowment of power, Amid, yes, persecutions, imprisonments, is gospel and glorious proclamation of Jesus. That, well, we've just taken a a brief bird's eye view assessment of that church, the New Testament church. That's the church marching in glory, defying the world, defying the world's systems and the world's demigods, bearing powerful witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of our Lord, and the soon return of our Savior. That's the church. That is the church that the Lord is blessing in great abundance. We must want that. At this point, someone chimes in wisely, prudently. Someone says, someone says, but we we live in in a different era. Like, Like we live in a different world. Culture is is different. People have changed, that the times have changed, and, and, and there's some fairness to that. It would, be, it would be wrong of me to stand up here and, and just make the broad assumption that whatever we read in the book of Acts would look exactly the same in our day and age today. It's not going to look the same. For example, you're sitting in padded seats that was completely, completely far into the first century church. So stand up. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm but, 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 but to build on that, are, are you aware that, that in the first century church, for the most of the, the time of that first century, the hearers, the hear, you all, you, you would stand and, and the speaker would be the one seated. What happened to that? Right? What, what went wrong somewhere in the 2,000 years hence? It's not going to look the same. Let me, just, let me just bear all and confess that. It's not going to look exactly the same. But let me state this. Firstly, the problem facing humanity remains the same. Sin and self-intoxication. Secondly, the remedy for that problem facing humanity is precisely the same. Christ, His crucifixion, His resurrection, His reigning in glory, His return. The gospel is the same. Yeah, amen. If there's nothing else I say this morning that arouses you to say something, that's it. 
We don't modify, mutilate, distort, or alter one iota of this word until heaven or earth have first passed away. And I don't know about you, but by my observation, it seems like heaven and earth are still hanging around. This remains the same. So the problem facing humanity is the same. The remedy that God has provided in the gospel of Christ is the same. The text, the text is the same. It's the same book. It is an all-sufficient narrative that God has granted. A love letter of redemption and hope in Christ. Jude tells us that the, one of the last books written in this holy writ, this holy canon, Jude tells us that the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. That means that the faith delivered to the first century church in the canon of holy writ is the same faith delivered to saints of any and every church today. No additions, no retractions, no redactions. It is the same text. The empowerment of the Spirit remains the same. The same empowerment needs to energize and supercharge the mission of the church. It's not a new Holy Spirit because it's 2020. No one thought that. I, I hope no one thought that. It's the same Holy Spirit that came down at Pentecost that empowered the Christian church. And if we are a Christian church in continuity with the New Testament, then the day of Pentecost is our day of Pentecost. That's the day the Holy Spirit was sent to empower our church. The model... The model remains the same. The model remains the same. We're not smarter than the holy apostles of the New Testament. We've not cracked on to a new idea, a new program, a new, a new way to model this church. It should be modeled after that church of the New Testament. If the church of the New Testament had elders, we should have elders. If they had teachers, we should have teachers. If they have evangelists, we should have evangelists. If they have prophets, we should have prophets. The model is the same. A few less amens. What if anything does change then? What if anything does change? I mean, all that is just really set to rile up the crowd. It's red meat to the fans. What does change? Now, missiologists, they're, they're people that waste a lot of ink and spend a lot of time talking about mission. Don't often do a lot of mission. Theo yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be funny. Two people laughed. Throw me a bone here. Come on. Theologians, historians, love to debate this point throughout the ages. But I'll tell you this, and I want to be upfront. One advantage that we have... One advantage we have after 2,000 years of church history, one advantage we have is the ability to review 2,000 years of church history. It's pretty straightforward. We get to just look back and say, were there times when the church missed its assignment? Were there, were there times when the church got off center, where, where, where it failed, where it missed its mark? Are there, there times where we observe and we see what's called mission drift? They lose sight of what they're called for. They lose perspective of who has called them. They, they lose a sense of the importance of a high view of the Scripture, an exalted Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation by nothing other than grace through faith in Christ. Absolutely. Time and time and time and time again. So we could say that one common, altogether boringly predictable consequence is mission drift. Mission drift. Go back and assess it yourself. Take the advantage of a few days, maybe just a few hours, and, and put on your hat of a self-made historian and take a look at mainline denominations. What is their trajectory over time? What is their drift over time? How do they end up? Give them a generation or, or two or three. I've got nothing wrong personally, with mainline denominations, but the history is clear. The results are in. If you think a denomination is going to preserve fidelity to the Word, then you have put your trust in the very wrong place. Same with heroes of the faith. Why do you think it is that we have churches, Baptist and Reformed and 
Lutheran and Wesleyan. Because as heroes that we look at in history that stood firm on the bedrock of the gospel came along, they looked back, as John Wesley did, and said, the Anglicans are lukewarm. Give them a century, they've dropped the ball. I've come along to revive, to revitalize the church. History has shown us mission drift is a real phenomenon. Let's come back to this question. That is more important than perhaps what you were, even just for a few moments, able to realize. That even we as a church, we're not immune. You think we're immune? You think we're immune to mission drift? We're not immune. It lose sight, lose focus, lose our objective, lose our conscious awareness of where our empowerment comes from, what our message needs to be, and the way in which we need to model our church. We can lose sight of all that almost overnight without vigilance to maintain the sure footing on the word. But what changes? I asked this before. I I, I didn't answer it. Let, Let me try and answer this. What changes? This is the only thing the Lord has given us freedom to modify, freedom to meddle with. The only thing, the only thing is the means of delivery. The means of delivery. Are you aware that as far as church history goes, um, well, I said this before, padded pews are new. Microphones are new. Maybe you don't know this. Are you, are you aware that music is new? Do you know that? Do you know? Do, do you know that, that, a, that a tightly nice bound book with the scriptures in it, that, that, do you know that that's new? That'd be a guy who invented a, a printing press with movable type to make this a reality. Media is new. Electronic power is new. Hymnals, they're new. LCD screens, they're new. Social media, it's new. The internet, it's new. It's new. I've said this before, it bears repeating. Not looking forward to the day I have to sit down with my kids and tell them, your dad was born before the internet. It's just so ubiquitous today. How old are you? I had one of my kids ask me the other day, were you born in the 1800s? <laughs> I feel like it most days. Certainly that's true. I don't, I don't think I'm that old, but you know how your kids, when, when they begin to become self-aware, and the world around them, they just look at you and say, you must have visited with the dinosaurs. Let me say this. The message, the method, remains unchangeably the same. These are given by the Holy Spirit. And any church, preacher, believer, Christian, has no right to presumptuously assume they can be improved upon. Let's come back to Acts 1, verse 8. I'm going to find somewhere to land this because I, if I bear all in honesty to you, that was all meant to be introduction. So we're going to come back next week. We're going to visit it again. Don't miss next week. Please don't plan on being away. I've just, all I've given you is introduction. Don't not turn up. Please come back next week. Acts 1 verse 8. As we turn to Acts 1 verse 8, I want to restate this. The message and the method remains unchangeably the same. The message and the method remains unchangeably the same. And Acts 1 verse 8, Acts 1 8 encapsulates that the ESV study Bible has this wonderful line. It calls this the thematic statement for all of Acts. You know, as Luke, as Luke, the author of this wonderful narrative, the, the, same, yeah, the same Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke, as he's writing this, he's showing how the Holy Spirit empowered that first church and then went forth and drove this Gospel seed, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Drove that. So we, re- re- we revisit this, Acts 1.8, you will receive power. Can, can just for a moment, every one of you, just do everything you can for a moment and pay, pay as close attention to this as you possibly can. For just a moment, please. If you belong to the church of Jesus Christ, you have continuity with the New Testament church, then you have received power. You have received it. That is a promise of Christ that is not null and void. That is a promise of Christ that is a promise 
for every church that names the name of Christ and is faithful, faithful to the bedrock of Scripture and the Gospel. The promise is, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The source of that power is the very indwelling of the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The church has received power. We as individuals, in vital communion, in mystical union with Christ, we've received this power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Let me close with these few thoughts, and you've got to promise me you'll return next week. Where the gospel goes, it expands. Where the gospel goes, it always expands. You may not see it with your eyes. You may not necessarily be, be there to actually bear witness to the very expansion of the gospel. But wherever the seed of the Lord's word goes, it always bears fruit. And every church called to be on mission for Jesus must believe that its primary objective for existence is to see the gospel expand wherever it goes. In its own Jerusalem. I don't know if this was obvious to you this morning when you, when you came on into church here at Oak Grove. This is not Jerusalem. What? We are not in Judea. Does that mean we've missed our assignment? Like, have we, have we actually failed? Have we made a grave error? The elders and the pastors of this church need to uproot this building, have it transplanted over to Jerusalem, and then we can start again and finally be biblical. Is that what this is? No. This pattern, this model, Holy Spirit-inspired, grounded in the text of Scripture, is for every church. I know we're in Nacogdoches, where there are hundreds of churches, but you and I are not called by God in Christ to use that as a reason to not obey the injunction upon us to be missionaries here in our Jerusalem. We have no right to expect any other church, and there are great churches here in the city. We have no right to expect them to own the burden of winning their Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem. I'm not saying they're not welcome to. I'm not saying go find them where they're sharing Jesus and just give them a, this is Sparta, boom, kick them. I'm not saying that, right? Someone do that and film it for me. <laughs> I'm saying every church that wants to be in continuity with the New Testament owns the mission field of its Jerusalem, every church, and owns the broader region of Judea and goes to Samaria. <gasps> Have we gone to Samaria? Have we gone to Samaria? What would be our Samaria? What would be that outlying city, district, region that we as a church need to win? And always, always with that ambition to go to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. I'll, I'll finish with this story. Every local church has the same model to follow. We all start in our own place. We all work outwards in regional mission. We all should jump to another region and meet at the ends of the earth. Remember I was in India. I was with a friend of mine uh, who was a, a pastor in India, but he'd done his theological education over here in one of the big seminaries in the U.S. His English was very good. He was my main translator. And i got to tell you, we would, we would jump in these kind of all-terrain kind of trucks and we would just drive through mountains for what seemed like days on end to find villages and, and mountain groups and tribes that had never been reached with the gospel. I was there a number of years ago. Well, I think not that long ago, maybe 2016. I was with my friend, and not only was he my translator, but he was, he was my driver. Driving in India is a whole unique experience. I can't tell you how many goats we hit. You don't hit cows, of course. That's sacrilege, but goats, you hit them. It seemed like it anyway, with the rapidity that we were hitting them. <laughs> After hours and days of driving, it felt like it was unbelievable, we arrived at this just remote tribe. 
Our goal was to set up camp, put some speakers up. Uh, if they had electricity, often they didn't. But if they did, put some speakers up and just broadcast the gospel. We got in a lot of trouble. This is not part of the story. But one time, we did this, broadcast the gospel. And, uh, and uh, we realized that we'd actually set up the speakers to blast the gospel into a nest of anti-government ISIS militia. Praise God. They need the gospel. We found out, we found out that our speakers were set up to blast the gospel into this hidden militia group. And uh, we jumped into our truck and, and we just, it was in the top of a mountain, sped down this mountain. Like I was more afraid of the speed that we were cruising down this mountain, almost at free fall, than of the militia we left behind. We were hitting everything. Finally, we arrived at this tribe that from all we could tell had never heard the gospel before. And my dear friend, my dear friend, his name's Paul, he turned to me and he said, I guess we made it. And I was thinking to myself, did we have a plan? It didn't seem like we were following a plan. Made it. What do you mean? He said, well, this is as close as the end of the earth as either of us are going to get. You've made it to the ends of the earth. I thought, and I, for a moment when he said that, it, it felt kind of good. It's like, yeah, I did it, right? Ends of the earth. Check. Bucket list. Good to go. Ends of the earth. And then I looked at him and I said, Paul, you know what's really curious about that is you're not wrong. Uh, it's absolutely true, and I'm so delighted to be here with you to preach the gospel to these villagers for the first time they'll hear it. And, uh, and yes, people heard it, got saved, church was planted, it was incredible. That's not the point of the story. I said to him, what's almost confronting about that is where I'm from, Australia, is vastly further away from where the gospel started in Jerusalem than these villages here in this remote Indian mountain. I've come from further away to almost retrace my steps back toward Jerusalem to proclaim to people that are still not yet heard. In the world today, there are, there are thousands of ethno-linguistic people groups that have never heard the gospel. Nothing short of that is my ambition. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I want every one of you on board. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that the greatest delight we have here this morning is to proclaim Christ. We thank you, Father, that we stand here as humble recipients of this narrative, the book of Acts. We receive it not just as some abstract, distant, unrelated story. Father, we receive it as our story. This is our church. The church in Jerusalem is our church. The church at Antioch, our church. The church at Ephesus, in, in Galatia, and even in Rome, these are our churches. Because by the Spirit's grace, we are united and connected with them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that as we've done this excursion, this, this kind of 30,000 foot view of this great history of the church, my prayer, Father, is that we would feel, we would we would meaningly feel our part of that. We would get on board with what the Spirit's doing here in our Jerusalem, in our Judea, in whatever our Samaria is. And we would be going and ever going to the ends of the earth. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the exaltation of Christ. It's all about the coming of His kingdom. It's all about the encroachment of the kingdom of light in the kingdom of darkness. Nothing less, Father, my prayer is for nothing less than the world to be one to Christ. May we spend and be spent in this cause. May we own our part in this. Get on board. Get excited. Believe in the empowerment of the Spirit, which is already ours. And above all, that we would go, go, go and believe that wherever the gospel is proclaimed, it always bears fruit. Father, I pray this morning, even for those here in this room, in this church. I pray for any that are here this morning and they're not yet believers in Jesus. They've not yet received this wonderful good news. This salvation, this forgiveness of sins. This cleansing of their record. Wiping away all our wrongs in the blood of Christ. For He died to save us. He rose to justify us. He ascended to reign over us. He is returning to take us. 
We thank you for Jesus. May he be exalted this morning, even in the fruit of what this word produces. We ask all this in his name. Amen.